welcome to everybody. Uh, I am Louise, if you don't know who I am. I am the program manager here at uh, PSV Academy, and I will also be the host and facilitator for today's talk. Um, and I'll uh, walk you through a brief introduction of the Academy, and then we'll um, quickly hand over the, the uh, talk to, um, to Thomas and to Jonathan today. So let me just uh, start by sharing my screen here. So uh, today's agenda is uh, pretty much like we always do. It's a quick introduction uh, with me, um, mostly practical stuff, a little bit about the Academy. And then we'll uh, hand over the microphone to Jonathan, uh, our um, legal director. And he will talk a little bit about from the investor perspective about uh, what we think you should think of when you are starting your new company. Uh, so we are talking about very early stage, maybe even before you have a VC along. Uh, so what would we like to see before and give you some advice uh, on, on what to do before you, you get in touch with the VC. Um, and then after Jonathan, we will uh, say hi to Thomas. Uh, Thomas is a tech investor um, and also chairman of the board in several um, uh, startup companies and has been a founder himself. Uh, and he will uh, take your perspective or the founder perspective and be uh, and give you advice uh, from his experience um, and some stories from from what uh, he has been through uh, also. And then in the end, uh, at 9.45, we will do the live Q&A, and I will uh, get back to how that works in practice in, in just a moment, because um, for those of you who haven't been to the Academy before, I just briefly want to touch on what it is, um, because I think it's very important to know that our Academy is uh, not an academic program. Uh, we are doing something, uh, we think at least, a little bit different. We, we want to uh, do it a little bit more from the founder perspective and bring you some some uh, experiences and some really cool people in and talk about, of course, all the good stuff, but also all the hard stuff and how real life in as a startup is um, out there. Uh, so the Academy is curated by Priest Ventures um, because we have an idea that we want to help you guys. Um, we don't know everything, so we have all these founders helping us. Um, but we think it's important to hear these experiences as well. Um, so we have been through about 400 startup journeys since, uh, we, since we started. Um, and so we have a lot of good founders and a lot of uh, very um, talented founders who are willing to share their experiences as we go along. Um, we've been around since 2018, uh, the Academy, and um, so by now we have had a lot of different talks and a lot of different uh, um, open doors and content that, that is available to you. And you can kind of see here on the roadmap that we have divided into different subjects um, and you are more than welcome to explore all these topics on our website, psvacademy.tk. Um, where you can find, um, the, we have been uploading all these uh, previous talks and we've also had some um, created some digests and some other tools for you to explore uh, to help you in your startup so go ahead and um, and um, explore that if you'd like to know more or if you if there's something else that you'd like to to know more about in in, uh, in building your startup so we kind of call it our pool but it looks a little bit like this where we have a different kind of things that you can you can explore and there are different tags as well that you can you can sort uh, things out. So how it works, um, we need you to uh, help us help you. Uh, so it works this way that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please ask the questions in the Q&A function, not the chat, because um, that way I can prioritize all the questions in the Q&A when we get to it. We will be answering the questions at the end of the session, um, but feel free to just shoot uh, as we go along, as you hear uh, both Jonathan and Thomas uh, will pick it up in the end. Um, however, if you have uh, any technical questions or questions about Pre-Seed Academy or Pre-Seed Ventures, you're more than welcome to write to me in the chat and I will try to, um, to, to answer you the best I can uh, during as, or as we go along. Um, it, it would be really helpful if you would upvote your favorite questions in the Q&A function, because that way I know which, one, which uh, questions to prioritize. 
Uh, so please take a look if there's already an, a question like yours, uh, then just upvote that one uh, instead of writing one again. That will make it a little bit easier because we only have 15 minutes. So it would be really nice to organize it like this. Also, um, if you are left with questions after this, or if your question didn't get answered uh, during the, the Q&A, there's an opportunity to join our open door session, which is um, on September 1st. And Jonathan will be joining this open door session. So there's a great opportunity to hook up with him. Uh, if you don't know about our open door sessions, it's uh, 30 minutes online with one-on-one -on -one with typically our investment managers, but this time also uh, Jonathan is joining us. Uh, so you get like a, a really good uh, feedback uh, on whatever problem or issue that you have, um, but you need to sign up. It's free, but you need to sign up. So you can also uh, do that. Just a quick note on Take Barbecue coming up here in September. We are joining, uh, pre Adventures is joining um, or will be present at Take Barbecue and we'll have three debates that you can join. Uh, the, the last debate, that we haven't really um, figured out the title yet, but it, it, we're working on it. Uh, and we'll also have an open door uh, session there, uh, but it's, it's going to be a first come first serve. This time, usually we book people in, but this, this you just drop in. Uh, and then we're going to do, uh, from the academy side, a digital mental health care package uh, that will be like a platform where you can explore different tools and uh, articles and, and helpful stuff for you uh, as, a, as a founder. So that was uh, just a quick note on the Tech Barbecue. Of course, I will uh, send you out more information about that uh, when, we, when we get closer to it. So... Um, that was the very speed intro, uh, the fastest I've ever done, I think. Um, but I think that um, we all come here to to listen to Jonathan and Thomas and uh, not me talking about the Academy. So Jonathan, uh, would you like to uh, take over from here? Yes, thank you. I'll just try to share my screen. Okay, like this. Thank you, Luis. Um, good morning, guys. Um, glad to have you all uh, watching. Um, I trust you can hear me. Um, as Luis said, my name is uh, Jonathan, and I am uh, the legal director and attorney uh, with Pre-Seed Ventures. Um, and um, I didn't plan to to bore you all. Uh, for a long time about my background so so as you can see um in short i'm a i'm an attorney um educated from from three top tier law firms in denmark in copenhagen um after which i worked two years at a uh, startup called legal hero a SaaS based uh, startup um as a, as a partner and co-owner um and then last year i joined uh, pre seed ventures uh where I've, i have uh, among other things, um, the responsibility uh, uh, for negotiating um, and executing our investments. And that obviously includes uh, shareholders agreements. Um, so I guess that's why I've been uh, carefully chosen to speak about this particular topic. Um, yes, so my agenda for today is this. Um, I'm going to, to start with talking about uh, sales agreements, uh, what and why, meaning uh, what are they and, and why do you need them? Um, then I'm moving on to my checklist for the most important topics that you should discuss with your fellow founders uh, when you are drafting up your first shareholders agreements. Um, and at this stage, I mean, before you take in uh, external investments uh, from VCs or angels. And then uh, I'm finishing off with uh, talking a bit about what terms you should expect um, introduced in your shareholders agreements um, when you take in uh, VC investments from somebody like us. So that's uh, that's basically um, how my presentations are, are structured. So if you just uh, jump right to it, to the first um, first topic, shareholders agreements one why. Um, so as, as the name indicates, a sales agreement is obviously an agreement between the shareholders uh, of company. Um, the purpose 
of the shareholders agreements uh, is to, to protect the shareholders' investments in the company. It is to establish a fair relationship between the shareholders. And it's also uh, the purpose to govern how the company is run in terms of uh, governance structures, uh, board compositions, etc. cetera. Um, a shareholders agreement also allows the shareholders to make decisions about which outside parties may become shareholders in the future, um, which is obviously uh, relevant uh, if you consider taking in uh, investments from VCs or angels. And um, shareholders agreements also provide protection for minority uh, shareholders, um, for instance, advisors or uh, small angels or whatever um, with, with small ownership stakes. Um, sometimes I also have heard shareholders agreements referred to as a, a divorce document um, because it commonly also outlines down the process in case of uh, shareholder disputes. So if you have a dispute in the company um, between shareholders, how should it how should it be solved? Do you go straight to court? Do you um, sit down, do a mediation before or, or whatever? So, so that um, it has that function as well. <clears throat> so what we sometimes see is that uh, in your eagerness as a founder to uh, embark on this uh, venture journey, um, build the next unicorn um, to get on the wall uh, behind me, um, Sometimes you forget to conclude a shareholders agreement um, because you are simply just focusing on, on uh, building your company and creating value and doing uh, more uh, business critical stuff. And, and that can be fine uh, as long as you in the founder group are in total agreement of everything, the sun, the moon, and everything in between. Um, as long as you are in agreement it's perfectly fine uh, not to have a shareholders shell, agreement. Um, but what happens when you disagree in the founder team, uh, things mm, might get messy and you don't have any contractual framework to help you solve the dispute and outline the process going forward. What happens then? Um, I'm gonna dive into that. Um, first, I've brought a little, uh, little uh, example of how bad it can actually go um, between two founders. If I can get it to work. Um. I don't think there's a sound, Jonathan. Ah. Okay. Can I assure how I can put it on? Does it work now? No. No? Oh, okay. Okay, never mind. Skipping this. Skipping this. Sorry. So, okay, in my example, um, it was it was a scene from uh, the social network where uh, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, diluting his founder friend Edward Severin uh, pretty heavily. Um, and I brought, I brought that to um, show that two former best friends uh, can end up in, uh, can end up uh, being uh, rather unhappy with each other. And I, I mean, from, from what we've heard, um, Mark Zuckerberg's for uh, frustration uh, with Edward Severin's performance was based on the fact that Mark Zuckerberg didn't think that that uh, Edward Severin um, added value uh, to the company, uh, and accordingly, uh, Mark Zuckerberg he found it to be fair to dilute Edward Severin uh, as the only shareholder in the company, and presumably, and that's obviously uh, heavy speculation from my side. None of none of those things were were happened if if they have had a solid shells agreement outlining both their respectively work obligations, as well as the process in case of an internal dispute. So so um, I think you can see it there on the slideshow afterwards. But but um, it was just to sort of 
give you an example of um, how great a, a harm it can cause to a company if uh, you don't have a shareholders agreement. Um, and from a legal perspective, what happens if you if you don't have a shareholders agreement? Um, then you are relying on the background law, which is the Danish Companies Act, um, and that entails, among other things, that a party, uh, a shareholder with um, with a uh, little more than a third uh, majority of the votes in a company, he or she can veto uh, changes in the company's art articles of association. It also entails that a, a party cannot be forced to sell his or her shares. Um, and uh, furthermore, it entails that there is no regulation if a founder stops working uh, or resigns his or her position uh, with the company. Um, and that means the shares uh, are kept uh, on uh, founder hands, uh, creating a uh, dead weight in the, the cap table. Um, it also entails that there is no regulation if a founder does not work as much as expected, which uh, I think is uh, <laughs> it was the problem uh, between Mark Zuckerberg and Edward Severin. Um, and then there are also the problem of uh, no regulation as to uh, competitive activities if a, if a founder stops working or resigns his or her position with the company. So if you don't have a shareholders agreements, you on all these things. Um, and that's, that's why I have stated here that it is actually business critical uh, getting a shareholders agreement because it is simply uh, too uncertain. It's too uh, risky not to have one um, for the reasons that I just uh, outlined um, on the price slide. Um, so my advice to you is that you should discuss and conclude your shareholders agreement as soon as possible after you uh, incorporated your startup company with partners. Or if you are a sole founder, um, you should do it as soon as possible uh, after, actually before you accept new shareholders in your startup. Um, because when things go wrong, um, it's it's too late to, to fix this. Um, um, like um, in, in reverse. So do it while you're all happy and while uh, things are all good uh, between you. Um, another point for me is that uh, sometimes we see these, uh, I, I've called it one size fits all agreements, uh, where you uh, simply just find a template on the internet uh, or maybe you get a template from your one of your friends who founded something uh, five years ago. Um, so it's my experience that these one-size-fits-all agreements, they rarely work out the way they are meant to. Um, so when things go wrong and you actually look in, in the shareholders agreement, um, you might be disappointed as to, as to your legal position. So, so you should really carefully consider to ask a lawyer to draft up your shareholders agreements. Um, in order for it to be customized from the beginning, because then you actually get the legal position that uh, you want to. Um, and one more point, um, you should do what you can to keep it simple, uh, your first shells agreement. Um, it will uh, for sure get more complex down the road anyway, um, especially when you start taking in investments from, from a business angels or VCs, um, I'm coming back to that later, but but we have requirements, so it will get complex uh, down the road. Uh, so you might as well keep it simple at the beginning. Um, so this was like kind of setting the scene um, for what the shell screens are, and I hope you all understand why you need them. And if you don't, um, please. Uh, Please watch the video of Mark Zuckerberg and Edward Severin, and then you uh, will be sure to understand why. Um, so now I'll be moving on to my next topic, which is um, my checklist for your shareholders agreements. Um, and this is the checklist for your first shareholders agreements. So it's, it's meant as a, as a, a point in time when you, where you are early stage and where you have 
not taking in any investments. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, these are the six topics that I have um, that I've chosen uh, for you to. Uh, I think you should give them some extra extra thought um, when you're drafting up your first shareholders agreement with your fellow founders. So the capitalization of of the company, um, you should you should consider how much capital the company is incorporated with. Um, usually, it's uh, an EPS with with forty thousand kroner. Uh, that's how um, most companies are incorporated. Um, but you might be doing something that require further uh, capital up front. So you should you should have a talk about that um, from from the beginning. Um, you should should also have uh, like aligned expectations as to whether you are as founders required to fund the company beyond your initial um, your initial capitalization. Uh, so if in six months or half a year uh, the company uh, is lacking funds, um, what do you do then? Uh, do you fund it further yourself or or yeah? What's the plan? Um, you should align at least expectations with each other uh, on that um, upfront. Um, you should also have a talk about the management, meaning how's the company operated, um, how many managers do you have, um, and what's the the governance structure uh, of the company? Uh, like, do you do you establish a board of directors? So what we see is that most founders, they start up with a company uh, which only have uh, management, which is perfectly fine and legal. Um, and then the, the board of directors are introduced um, when you take in your first investment. Typically, um, VC or angels will take uh, off board positions. So um, give it a thought from the beginning, um, how you structure your, your leadership of the company. You should also have a look at each other in the eyes and have a talk about uh, your your work obligations. So are all founders full time on the project? Um, if not, are you allowed to sit in boards and do other stuff on the side? Are you allowed to, to do consultancy work on the side? Um, are you taking out salary, uh, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, those things go hand in hand. So so. And there's no uh, one size fits all um, solution to this. But what we most commonly see is that very early stage, most founders, they all um, do something on the side to, to earn a little money. And then they, they don't uh, take out money of the company. Uh, they don't get any salary. And then when you get your first investment, you typically um, skip all your side projects and go full time on your startup. And then you are also um, getting paid a uh, salary uh, from, from the company. But um, give it give it a thought, align expectations, so you don't end up in a, in a situation. Um, you should also carefully consider um, what we call the right of first refusal, which is um, basically what, what, what's happening if one of the founders wants to sell his or her shares. Do the rest of the founder group uh, have a right to to buy? Uh, obviously, we recommend that you that you have in order to keep gas on either company hand or or your or founder hands. Um, you might also want to to have a, a, a regulation of how the price of the shares uh, should be calculated, because um, a right of first refusal clause isn't worth that much um, if you don't. Um, have have the money to, to buy it basically. Um, Non-competition. What happens if a founder terminates his or her position uh, in the company? Um, you should regulate that, uh, restrict it, and breach. How is it handled if a founder is in breach of of, of his or her own obligations? Um, is there a penalty or whatever? You should you should uh, really uh, give that some thought. Um, I can see that I'm a bit after, uh, I'm a 
taking a bit more time, so I'm just not rushing this, but I'm I'm just uh, I think I'm going to to skip this a little bit, just saying it really fast. So when you take in um, VC investment, uh, you we will typically require that you do um, that we will present our standard documents to you, uh, and um, we are obviously willing to negotiate uh, our agreements are not take a leave it deal um so you should i mean you should agree you should negotiate your shell agreements with us but also bear in mind that we are vc so we have requirements um we require certain uh, clauses in the shell agreement that you probably haven't had before and what do we require um we require a lot of things, but 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 these are like mandatory for us. So we requ we require preemption rights, which means that we are allowed to subscribe for further shares um, on future financing rounds. Uh, we don't want to be diluted, so we require a right to subscribe for for shares on, on further rounds. Um, we also want to um, make your startup. Uh, attract talented employees to take it to the next level. So we require you to allocate warrants, uh, which are future shares um, in the company to attract uh, the right talent. And, and typically we, we uh, ask you to allocate 10% 10, 10 of the company um, share capital. Um, then we have found the log up. So we don't want you to, to sell your shares in the company after we invest, obviously. Um, so we usually lock you up for three years, meaning that you cannot sell your shares for three years period. And in that period, you are also subject to a key person clause as a founder where you uh, vest your shares um, monthly. And if you leave, uh, you can only keep the vested shares uh, unvested shares must be sold back to the company uh, for the nominal price. Uh, if you're a good lever, if you're a bad lever, we will punish you and buy off all your shares really cheap. And then we require tag along, drag along. So that's closest. And I think Thomas is, is uh, giving you some practical examples of, of, the, of those. But a uh, tag along clause is a clause where if someone sells, uh, the other parties are entitled to co sell. So it's a, it's a co sell uh, right. Um, and the drag along is a clause that's stating that if the majority wants to sell, um, the majority can force the minority to co-sell on similar terms. So the mi minority is dragging uh, the minority, um, meaning that uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a sale uh, duty to sale uh, clause. And then lastly, you should be prepared for um, giving us. Uh, information so we typically want to uh, monitor your performance uh, uh, we want to um, track some kpis uh, and that's and we also want to to get involved on a strategic, strategic level so typically we establish a board and take a board seat and then acquire information and reporting to be able to track your performance so these these six uh, main things are what you can expect when you uh, consider taking in investments from us. So sorry, I rushed uh, this uh, last part a bit, but um, time flies by when uh, you're talking about such a funny subject. So um, I think I will uh, pass the talk to, um, to Louise and Thomas. All right. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, I was just thinking that uh, we actually have a lot of resources on warrant pools and, um, and cap tables already in the academy. So if you want to explore that a little bit further about what it means and how you should do it, uh, there are other startup talks already recorded. Uh, so you can go on our website and, and just um, and, and use the tag legal and then they will show up. So go to the resource pool and then uh, use the tag legal and you can see more resources on warrant pools. Um, and I was also thinking, and there was, this was just an idea for you, uh, if you want me, me to do like a dictionary uh, kind of thing, um, let me know in the chat if this is something you need. I can do maybe like um, 
like a, a, a digest or something with all these different uh, uh, terminology that uh, because it's a little bit different terminology I think so so let me know in the chat if you if this is something you'd like then I can I can produce something together with Jonathan uh, later so let's uh, move along and uh, Thomas are you ready to uh, help us even further I think I am um, let me see if I can get this up and running can you guys see my screen yes perfect all right, so I'll take a slightly different view on this. Um, I've been a founder uh, my entire professional career, so I'm very biased when it comes to evaluating shareholder agreements. Um, I've been through quite a few. Um, so I've done I, I've done a few of the do's. I've done a lot of the don'ts and the fuck ups. Um, so I'll try to see if I can um, steer some of you guys out of that. Um, I've been doing startups for about 15 years. Uh, as Louisa said, I've been doing some of my own, primarily in the US. I've lived there for about 10 years. Um, and recently, I've been very, very fortunate to work with a lot of very cool founders and startups in Denmark, in the US, um, across Europe. Um, I've been doing you know, startup startups, like from the very, uh, from, from scratch, I've been working within very large corporations on some of their startups um, as a consultant. So I've, I've kind of seen um, a very good picture of, of, of what's out there and, and been fortunate enough to work with some, some very cool people. Let's see if I can Cool. All right. So I'll kind of look at, at three areas of this, you know, the early days, what you got to, you know, pay attention to your first VC money. Um, and then once you want to exit and exit, you know, means a lot of different things, but, but I'll, I'll get back to that. So if we look at, you know, you start a company, um, you have your co-founders uh, and you typically also have some friends and family who spit in, you know, a little bit of cash to get you going the first couple of days. And that's really where, you know, the first, the first problems start arising, although you don't become aware of it until years down the road. You know, this is really where most people make the biggest mistakes. Um, there are so many situations where, you know, you, you give a few shares or you sell a few shares to some friends and family. And as, as Jonathan talked about, there's a lot of miscommunication between even the founder team. Some, sometimes people have a job, you know, one of the founders has a, has a different job. Um, so there's a, a miscorrelation in terms of how much work each person should do. So, and as I've, you know, felt some very personal experience, it's so much easier to get all of this paperwork done when there's no money involved and there's no spouses involved. You know, when you're young, you're just started out, everybody's sitting in the same basement and pretty much on the same page. That's when you want to spend a little cash, get a good startup lawyer. And I mean, you know, I really do mean a lawyer that's been doing startups, you know, not, you know, a family lawyer friend or something like that, but somebody who's done this for a living um, to get the paperwork done between, um, between the founders and also in terms of, you know, getting the first, you know, investment. I, I actually had a, a very personal one where we just, my first, my very first startup, we started out and we gave some shares to some of the, the key employees. Um, and years later, when we had to sell the company, we realized that one of the first, um, you know, share programs we, we gave out didn't really have a drag and tag along clause connected to it. So when we had to sell the company uh, for a lot of money, this person um, who no longer worked for the company said, well, you know, I'm really not gonna, I'm not gonna sell my shares. I'm gonna cling on to my half percent of the company, which made the whole deal kind of grind to a halt. And in the end, we, we, we worked out something with him, but it was very expensive. And I wish I'd used a better lawyer up front because it was a very, very expensive learning money. So, you know, you know, as I wrote, you know, a, a, you know, a bad shareholder agreement, a shop, you know, can seriously kill a company or totally kill your fundraising. So, you know, this is not just fun and games. This is really serious stuff. You have to um, pay attention and you have to, even though you have no money, you have to, you know, get a little bit of cash and find a good lawyer to get this paperwork done. Then you hopefully move on. You're, you're on a wave, you're, you're rushing through it, you're building your company, you're scaling, and then the first real VC money comes on board. And this is where you really, really got to pay attention because now it's no longer a game of you and your friends who both know nothing about shareholder agreements 
Now it's a game between you who know nothing and a VC who knows everything about this. Um, and, and this is where I really have the founder perspective because, you know, Jonathan went through some of the stuff. He, he used words as, you know, if you're a bad lever, we'll, we'll, we'll buy your shares for really cheap, you know, or we'll, or there's some mandatory stuff we have to get in there. You know, there's nothing that is market term. There's nothing that is mandatory. You know, when you're, when you're doing a shareholder agreement, when you're raising money, you know, it all depends on your leverage. You know, if you have a good company that's growing fast, you can get away with anything. That's why, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs, you know, uh, the, the Snapchats, they still have majority sh um, voting rights in the company. Even though they don't own the majority of the company, they have majority voting rights. That means they still own the company. So once you take VC money, it's like crack. You never go back. You know, this is really a question of, you know, do you want to go the VC route? Then that's fine. But once you take your first pot of money, you're committed. Like you can't, you can't turn back and say, now I just want to go grow organically. You, you're on a fast track for better or worse. Um, and you got to be really conscious about that. And there's a ton of stuff in there that I won't go into, but there's like the good lever, bad lever is, 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 is one to, to keep in mind because maybe a bad lever is somebody who quits. So maybe the VC decides to make your life a hell or your co-founder decides to make your life a hell and you wanna quit. But if you quit, you lose all your stocks, you lose all your options. Um, you know, and, and the other problem is typically when you get to the negotiation part of the fund round, funding round, you've been going at this for so long already. You spent months trying to find VCs who even wanna to listen to you. Then you spend months trying to culture the VCs who actually wanna to listen to you to get them to invest. Uh, and then when you get to there and they start throwing legal stuff at you, you simply fatigue out. So you go like, oh man, I just, I just wanna get on with growing my company. There's legal stuff I don't really care about. Let's just move on. And then two years after that, you're in a, you're in, big trouble because you said yes to some of those things. So it's super tough and I don't know the easy way. I've always kind of fatigued out when we did VC stuff and, and accepted stuff that I probably shouldn't have, but it's just, it's super, super tough. Um, the one thing I really want to stress when you're doing this is take a good old fashioned spreadsheet and calculate how many shares you have. And if you sell your company for, let's say a hundred million, how much money do I get? Because the valuation is just one parameter. There's so many different ways to slice and dice these shares and there's a preferential shares. And I bet you all the VCs, most VCs want some kind of preferential shares. So, so just because you have 10 or 20 or 30% of the company after the, the funding round, doesn't mean you get 30% of the money. You might actually only get 10% of the money um, in, a, in, a sale, in a sale process. So, so use a good old fashioned spreadsheet, calculate, you know, if we sell for hundred million, how much money do I get? And is it worth it? You know, that's, that's, that's a really, really important part of it. Um, and don't listen to all the, the other thing, don't listen to all these, um, you know, people saying, look, you know, we, we traded a valuation of a billion dollars. Sometimes these companies, when they go out and say, look, you know, we traded at this value, this very, very high valuation, the VC who came in have so many preferential treatment that if they just sell, like even the company was valued at a billion, if they just sell for 50 million, the VC will get all their money back and the founders will get nothing. So, so, so the valuation, although that's kind of what you talk about on TechCrunch, it, it's, it's actually a smaller part of it. You got to really look at the whole thing because so many people make mistakes on this. Um, the, the, last one is the, uh, the last one is the exit, you know, and, and there's a ton of different ways to, to exit your company. Um, you can go public, you can sell to a competitor or, you know, somebody else in the industry, you can get bought out by equity money. You know, there's all these different scenarios in terms of an exit. Um, common for all of those is that if you ask any M&A lawyer, merger and acquisition lawyer, if you ask any M&A lawyer, where, where does the issues arise? It's on the shareholder agreement, like every single time. I have not been in a single exit scenario and I've been in a few where we didn't have to sweet talk and you know, threat and, and beck to get some employees or some former employees or some early investors 
to sign a document because their shareholder agreement wasn't clear on something and the deal couldn't move forward. You know, I, I, you know, I've been in, in, uh, in an exit scenario where we had to sell a company for $500 million and there was literally three early employees that no longer worked there. We had to get to sign a document, you know, in order for the deal to go through. So, so it's kind of coming back to the thing, you know, you really want to pay attention early on because it can cost you a shit ton of money to figure it out down the road. Um, we had a, another situation more recently where we had to IPO a company. So basically take it public. And, uh, and again, a couple of friends and family uh, decided that, you know, even though they got extremely lucky and invested in a company they knew nothing about, uh, and, and it, it was very successful and it got to a stage where it could IPO, they just wanted a little bit more money, you know, and, and a lot of people think when, when you do all these contract works, it's to figure out, you know, it's to avoid going to court with another company, that our companies usually never go to court, co-founders do a lot, and it's, and it's very nasty, and, um, uh, and it's, and it's, and it's very, um, it's very heartfelt, right? Because you, you're usually going up against people that you thought were your friend, thought were your family, um, and you know, thought you trusted them. And suddenly you're on opposite sides of this. And I've seen it, luckily, luckily the, the, the family friend thing, I haven't experienced you know, on my own, but I've seen it with a lot of companies where I'm you know, helping the CEO and suddenly they're in this situation and, and they're so frustrated. They're like, look, you know, I've been sweating my ass off doing 100 hour weeks and these guys get extremely lucky and make a lot of money on a very small investment and now they want more it's just it's unbelievable um and it's totally avoidable and, and that's the frustrating thing for a lot of these guys totally avoidable if you early on go in and focus on getting the paperwork sorted you know by by a good lawyer and and i, I look and i know uh, I've never done it myself because, you know, early on you're like, shit, you know, I don't want to spend that kind of money. Let's just like, I have something from yesterday or from, from last year, but it's, it's, it's really good enough. Luckily, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, you manage to work it out, um, you know, but it's, it's expensive and, um, and it's, it's, it's time consuming and, and frustrating. And it's something that doesn't really help grow your company or add value anywhere. Right. Um, I think there's a, you know, uh, Jonathan brought up, you know, the, the network, you know, there's another scene where um, the, the Winklevoss brothers, you know, and they asked Zuckerberg, like, you know, what he's, he's asking his lawyer, like, what should I do? And she's, he's, she's like, you should pay him, you know, it's just a speed bump, you know, and I think, I think he paid, paid them $500 million. So it's an expensive speed bump, you know, but that's, you know, the, the bigger you get, the more expensive, you know, not having these shareholder agreements uh, becomes. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I wanted to make up a little bit of time so Louisa can get to her Q and A. Um, should I, should I kill the, the screen share? Sure. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, so we'll just uh, jump right into the uh, Q and A. And I see that there's a lot of great questions there. Thank you very much. Um, but I also think that we could just spend 30 seconds reading some of them through and upvote some of them that you are also interested in because there's not so many that are upvoted. So go ahead and just spend 30 seconds skimming them through and see if there's any that are more uh, interesting to you than others. Um, and, but uh, otherwise I'll just uh, start with, uh, with some of the questions while you guys are also reading through. So let's uh, start with the top one here. Um, very basically, where, how can I find a good startup lawyer? Is it hard for me to gosh the skills? And how much does the shareholder agreement roughly cost for a new startup? Uh, Jonathan, you've been through this a few uh, times. So should, would you like to start here? Yeah, so, so I think uh, picking, the, uh, the right, uh, picking the right lawyer um, is extremely difficult. Uh, when you are not uh, a lawyer yourself, knowing uh, knowing everybody in the in, in the space, so um, yeah, I think it's it is difficult. But but uh, if some of you um, if you if you're looking for a startup lawyer, I'd be happy to share some recommendations. Uh, so feel free to to drop me an email afterwards or, or give me a call. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'd be happy to to give you some recommendations. Um, can 
I think yeah. I think also look. I mean, look at their website. You know, unless they describe startups and that's what they do, they're not experts. You know, look at exactly. you know. I, I use and this is by no means a commercial, but I use I use Coolman sometimes. They have a couple of people who focus on on this and do nothing else. They have a podcast. I mean, that's what they do. They they try to like keep taps on things. You know, DLA DLA has a has another one. Uh, a couple of people that does this, you know, but you can use basically any, anyone, but if they don't have it on their website and they don't advocate that this is what they're doing, they're, they're not experts, you know? Uh, and that's why I kind of, I made the example, like don't use a family lawyer, you know, cause lawyers and like, <laughs> no offense, but lawyers has a great tendency to say like, oh, I can totally do that. Right. But, but the truth is they probably don't, they'll throw it to their intern and then they'll do it. And the intern, you know, unless that's all they do, We'll do a really shitty job at it. So focus on who advertises that this is what they do. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a law firm called Masenti. They do a lot of, of, of venture as well. Uh, there's a law firm called Highbridge. Um, they only do venture. Um, so so um, I, I completely agree with Thomas. Um, and how much does it cost? I mean, that's it depends on a lot of things. Uh, how extensive. Uh, how extensive a sales agreement do you need? Um, time and effort and, and, and everything. But I mean, if you if, if it's your first and you spend uh, twenty thousand, I think you can get where you want where you want to be. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, jump to the next question here. Uh, in an early stage startup where the co-founders are working on the side, is there a good way to measure how much work each founder is doing? I feel like with or without a shareholders agreement is very hard to measure and prove whether a co-founder is pulling their weight. Thomas, would you like to start on this? Yeah, I mean, unless they're full time, they're not pulling their weight, right? You know, it's, it's impossible to, you know, and it's usually what happens around the first you know, seed round is like, you got to figure out whether you commit to this. And, and from an investor perspective, you know, it's hard to throw in money, you know, put in money into a company and have one of the co-founders go like, well, I don't believe in this enough to, to bet my career on it. You know, I'd still like my, you know, my side job. Um, so, so there's, so it's not just about how much work you put into it. I, I think anybody who did a startup knows that this is a full-time and, and much more than a full-time job to, to get it to work. It's so hard to get a company um, to success and spending anything less than your full-time is, is, is not full-time. You know, and I think if somebody wants to stay on the side, you know, there could be family reasons for that, you know, not wanting to make that gamble. I totally respect it, um, you know, but, but then but then it's a different shareholder agreement. And sometimes these, these adjustments can also be made when you do the various rounds, you know, then the person who's full-time gets some warrants, the person who's not doesn't, you know, and gets diluted equally along everybody else, you know, but, but I think, you know, unless you're, unless you're sitting side by side, you're not, you're not, you know, full-time on it. Mm. Do you want to tell any more perspectives on that? Or? Yeah, I think you. I think it's it's impossible to measure. So, so I think um, I, again, I agree with Thomas, and I think uh, the most important thing here is that you that you uh, that you start a startup with founders that you trust, that you that you trust that, that they are committed um, as much as as, as you are yourself. Mm. Okay, so I have a I have a related question here. Um, why would you not want your co-founder to sit on other boards? Could there be any conflict of interest? I think that was one of your slides, uh, Jonathan, where you mentioned that. Uh, yeah. Um, this. Could you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, founders can sit on the board, and and I mean, that can be fine. Um, I think we prefer to have industry experts sitting in the boards because they, they create value um, for the company uh, more than uh, more more than the founders. Uh, oh, okay. So it's it's the own board of the startup, so not yeah. other boards, but the. Oh, but okay, other boards. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that's again uh, like what Thomas talked about. Um, it, doing a lot of other stuff can be like a D. It's a, it, it could be a defocusing uh, what you should focus on, uh, like building your own company. So, and that was just an, an example. So, sitting on other boards, um, doing uh, work on the side as a consultant or whatever. Um, that was just um, a different example. Mm. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas. Any perspective on this, or should we uh, 
No, I mean, I, well, I, I think it's fine to sit on other boards, you know, when, when you're doing your company, but there's definitely a limit to how much you can do. You know, mm-hmm. my, my first startup, I certainly wasn't on any boards, you know, partly because nobody wanted me on a board, uh, but, uh, but also because I, I, I just didn't have the time. You know, it was, it was you know, I, I left work, you know, at midnight on a good day. So, um, okay. All right. Um, in an early stage startup where the co-founders are working on the side, is there a good way to measure how much work each founder is doing? Uh, okay, we already answered this. Hold on. Okay, so let's jump to the next one. Uh, when negotiating the term sheets, will the VC play on your insecurities, risk suddenly everything is bad about the idea, blah, blah, to drive the negotiation? Any advice on how to keep your cool and your leverage? Yes, they will. <laughs> No, they totally will. Look, they, 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 you know, and look, and there's different VCs, like not all VCs are evil. It's like probably only 90% of them, but, but it's, you know, it's it, 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 like, it's a negotiation. Look, why wouldn't they position themselves the best? And I, and, and, and also the, you know, it differs on territory. I think you're, ugh, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm treading deep water here, but, but some, some VCs in some territories are more prone to, um, you know, exploit some of the weaknesses in the negotiation. Mm. And Thomas, do you have any uh, suggestions for what such a founder can do then? Like, should they team up with a lawyer for these shelter agreements or what, what can yeah, they do? Definitely. Look, and that's what I said. They, they need to get a lawyer who, who understands the market they're in. And, and I haven't done very many shareholder agreements in Denmark, uh, you know, to be honest, but, but, you know, wherever you're doing it, get a local lawyer. Look, if you're doing a agreement, you know, with a, a UK VC, you know, get a UK lawyer. If you're doing, if you're lucky enough to get, a, you know, US money, which typically tries trades at higher valuations, get a US lawyer, you know, you know, you need people who understands it. So when the VC says, well, this is market terms, look, it might've been 12 months ago, but, but, but today it's totally different. You know, three years ago, a company trading at 10 X ARR was a very high valuation today. That's, that's super low. So, you know, due to a lot of different things, right? So you want to get somebody who's current, you want to get somebody who's local, and one of the VC says, look, this is market terms, this is standard, this is mandatory, <laughs> you know, no, it's not, you know, you, you know, you can trade, you can trade on every single parameter, you know, so I've seen, you know, we talked about this, you know, what's preferential shares and stocks, et cetera, like a lot of, a lot of deals in, in, in the Bay Area right now are being done where everybody has common shares, so everybody has the same level of stocks. Which if you tell that to a Danish lawyer, you know, they'll say that's completely unheard of. We'd never do that. You know, but over there it's so competitive with the best startups that they basically say, look, everybody's going to be on the same page. Mm-hmm. You know, so so there is all these different things, what's standard and what's not. And you need a good lawyer to help you because you don't know. Um, Okay, so there's actually a related question here to you, Thomas. Uh, uh, Hans here asks, is it better to be funded by a large business angel rather than a venture capital fund in terms of getting more favorable shareholder, shareholder agreements? What's your opinion on that? Look, I mean, it, it's, probably, it's probably better uh, to take, you know, a private investor in terms of your in terms of negotiating some of these things, you know, it's, it's certainly easier something like if you look on average, it's, that's probably the easiest way. But, but the reason to take money is also to get help. Look, and, and one of the things, you know, especially first time founders lack is experience. They, they haven't grown a company, they haven't hyperscale, they haven't done all these different things. And if you get the right VC, it will help you do all of that. You know, they will help you hyperscale. They have a playbook you know, they have connections to super smart people that's done this 20 times before. And then you can tap into all of that. So you, you don't get money from a VC for the money. You get, you, you, you get money and then you get experience, which also makes it super important to pick the right VC. And that's so easy to say, because like very, very few companies get to a stage where they will be able to attract VC money and even fewer, you know, fractions get to a stage where they can cherry pick what VC they want. You know, most, most, most funding rounds is like, and even like some of the greatest companies, like their first funding rounds were like, they took whoever wanted to give them cash. But, but even saying that, you still have to kind of do some due diligence on the VC. Ask them, like, well, how big is your non-funding team? Which basically means how many people 
are not just trying to do deals, but are helping, helping the startups after the deal is done. Like, do you have people in marketing? Do you have people in sales? Do you have people in recruiting that can help you with that? And ask them when, when they're pitching you go like, that's super fine. Can you connect me to like Plio, uh, which hopefully most of you guys know the, the fastest growing um, FinTech startup here, like Yep, the founder is a good friend of mine. And when he did his funding round, when they pitched him, because they were pitching him, he said, that's great. Introduce me to 50 potential customers. Like use your network, introduce me to 50 potential customers. They did, you know, and the ones who worked the fastest, those were the ones you talked more with. So, so even, even in this kind of back and forth stage of like trying to figure out the VC, you know, don't be afraid of asking some questions and see what they can do back to you. Mm. Uh, um, yeah. All right. So, so while the VCs can have a lot of uh, wants on this, we want to do, but they also have some more experience and a great network to supply to, to kind of balance that weight. Great. Yeah. 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 Okay. So here's a, a question for you, uh, Jonathan, uh, because I, I know this was on one of your slides. Um, Pia asks, what does it mean that a 33.4 majority can veto changes in the articles of association? Or what does articles of association mean? Um, yeah, so that's the articles um, are basically um, like uh, the rules of the company. Um, and they are publicly available uh, on, on, the, on the CVR and VX Co. Um, but but uh, the problem here is that um, almost everything you do in a company, um, when you take in financing, uh, if you want to change your board, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, that require uh, that you change your articles of association. So if you cannot change them, you basically cannot do anything. So that's why it's a problem that that uh, that a small but small but that a minority can can veto uh, changes mm, okay i hope this answered uh, your question pia um let's jump to the next one right away uh we just have a few minutes left is it usual to establish a warm pool so early pre-seed seed as it as this dilutes the founders much earlier um thomas would you like to start on this yeah sure look i mean it... It, that also depends on where you are, right? In the U.S., there's no way to hire anybody without, you know, giving them warrants, you know. And I, I think that's catching up in Europe. It's going to get it's harder and harder, and people are more and more aware. You know, when when I did, you know, I think like 10 years ago when I did some of my first startups in Denmark, nobody knew about warrants. You know, where it was completely standard in the U.S. Um, so it, it depends. I, you know, warrants is also, yeah, yes, it dilutes the, the founders, but, but bear in mind, you know, let's say you give somebody, you know, 1%, like a key hire, 1%, you know, equity early on, that 1% is going to get diluted to 0.1 or 0.2% by the time you hit your series B. Um, so you're going to have to fill it up anyway. So it's not it's not that expensive to give warrants early on, uh, as long as you don't throw them around to anyone. But, but one thing I do want to say is a lot of VCs, especially the really good ones, are very very conscious of your cap table. So if you get to a Series C and is all sorry, you know, a seed round or a Series A, and is all and are already diluted down to let's say you know twenty percent as a founder, they're going to say, look that's not going to work for us because we want the founder to have, you know, a solid chunk of the company. So you got to really look, you know, I think, I think warrants is, is a great way to also save cash and get some good people. Um, but you really got to stay mindful of your cap table because that will also kill a deal. If you, if you're diluted, your founder team, there's no way to do a deal. And I've seen that so often. Look, then they give their, you know, accountant five percent or their lawyer ten percent, like to save money on, like just they're trying to save money, right? And in the end, they they've thrown away warrants to you know everyone, um, and and they diluted themselves. So really, only give warrants to key people who work full time in your company. Don't give it give it to anybody else. Mm. Thank you, Thomas. Jonathan, would you like to just give a few words on you know we are early stage VC. What would yeah. you like to see and what what's I, I agree. So we 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 typically ask um, the company to establish a warrant pool um, as a set of, of typically ten percent of the share capital, and that it that that is in order to. So we sit down with the company and we 
we we lay down a hiring plan. Um, so we we assess which which uh, core values, uh, which um, which competencies do the startup need uh, on the team, and then the Warren pool is a tool to get uh, the most skilled people um, to, to get them hired hired uh, to the company in order to take the company to the next level. So I think you should see a Warren pool as an investment um, in your employees. And as Thomas said, um, right now the market uh, is moving in a, in a direction where it's going to be difficult for you to attract um, the right employees if you don't to keep positions if you don't offer them warrants. Mm. Okay, so I feel that this conversation also is a lot about uh, the cap table and vesting and all these things. And I can just tell, say to everybody, we have a lot of great content about the uh, cap tables. We had a startup talk not so long ago with the cap desk, some a startup that does this for a living. So uh, go ahead and check all that out in our resource pool. Uh, there's lots of great stuff for you to explore this topic uh, even further. Um, so it's 10 o'clock, uh, time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas and Jonathan for joining and making us a a little bit more wiser on, on, on shareholders agreements. I hope everybody here and who joined us today got something out of it. Um, feel free to uh, hit us uh, up with questions or something. I will send out the email with the recording and the slides and also uh, the vocabulary uh, dictionary uh, thing. Um, and uh, don't forget that you have the opportunity to join us for the open door session where you can meet up with Jonathan. So uh, if you still have some questions, then make sure to apply for that. I will link to that as well. So thank you much, very much for today. And um, I'll see you guys around. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.